Good afternoon, welcome to New Life Online. It's great to have you join us again for our afternoon service. This afternoon what we're going to do is we're going to have a song, we're going to listen to a song of worship, and then after that we're going to join in with what our sermon was at Sanveen this morning. We pray that this service will be a real encouragement and blessing to you today. So let's pray. Father, we just ask that as we meet together, Lord, that we will encounter your spirit today afresh, that you will work in our lives, that we will be open to be shaped by you, and that, Lord, that we will be different from how we gather together to begin with. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to, uh, onward says this. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the, tri the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. Last week, we began uh, just a very short series. We're only looking at it last week and this week, looking at this idea of the power of expectation. Uh, a few years ago, I bought a little camera and uh, I, I, many of you know I love gadgets, and so I was keen to get this little camera called a GoPro camera that I'm sure some of you have or have heard of, which is a camera that's for action stuff. It's meant to be the idea that you, you use it when you're in the sea or different things, and it's waterproof, and it can film all the different stuff that you're wanting to see, and it stays intact, and it's all good. But on the videos that you watch, sometimes when you watch a trailer or an advert showing these types of cameras, there's all these people who are like skydiving or, or skiing down these extreme courses and doing all these different types of stuff. And, I, and at the time, I remember watching this video that, uh, that was GoPro cameras, expectation versus reality. And so the, this guy had put this video up and it was like expectation jumping out of a plane, reality attaching it to his dog and uh, getting a dog's eye view of what things were looking at. Expectation skiing down a hill, reality putting it in the dishwasher and seeing what it looked like when the dishwasher was working. These kind of things were the expectation versus reality of owning a GoPro camera. If I'm honest, my experience of it has probably been more like the putting it in the dishwasher than the, the, the skydiving. You see, sometimes in life, there's a tension between expectation and reality. Sometimes many of us here have experienced the reality of disappointment when things didn't quite match up to our expectation. We live in a world where social media is a big deal, and if you were to look at many people from Shetland's Instagram pages, their, their expectation, and I know we've got some visitors here, you've been blessed with a wonderful weekend of weather, but maybe your expectation was seeing these sun split in the sky, beaches, some killer whales popping out of the water and different stuff because you've seen the highlight reel. But in reality, nobody posts a, a Tuesday when the wind is 50 mile an hour and the rain's coming at 45 degrees. Expectation might have been one thing, but reality might have been something different. As I said, maybe you're living in that tension right now of the reality of what you're current circumstances look like, but the expectation of believing for something more. And living life, you know, there's maybe things that haven't quite worked out as you wanted them to work out. It can happen in all areas of life. When you're a child, you're full of expectation. If you were to ask many children what they want to do when they grow up, you'll find things like an astronaut. Maybe some of you wanted to be an astronaut when you're growing up, and now here you are sitting in front of a computer from nine till five in an office. It's not quite what your expectations were when you were younger. wonder what your reality is like at home or in your relationships or at work or wherever. What we're going to see through the short story or the, the, these short verses of Anna is that we're going to see somebody who kept an, a, a, a spirit of expectation even when her reality clearly at times had been more challenging. You see, I, I believe that we have an enemy who wants to rob us of our expectation. The Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and I think that we can see plenty of evidence of expectation that, that uh, you know, even at times we, we can get stolen from us through the pain of disappointment. This year, let's not lose our sense of expectation as to what God can do. Let's not let past experiences or current reality dampen our expectation of what we can trust God for and what we can see come to pass in our day. 
You see, as I said, your current reality might look different to what your highlights reel might be. But I want to say to you and remind you this morning, don't give up hope. We read the story of pre, uh, pre the crucifixion uh, when we were coming around communion, but there's this great story after the crucifixion where there's these two people walk into Emmaus on the road to Emmaus, and, and, and the risen Jesus comes and walks beside them, but they don't recognize it was him, but they're walking away from Jerusalem in, in disappointment. And they use these words that says, we had hoped. We had hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to rescue us. And then they think that hope has been buried in the grave. And then the end of that story is very different, that there suddenly, it says, their eyes were opened and they realized who was walking with them. Because he was the one who had hoped. And maybe just now, maybe that's where we're at on the story of our expectation, on the journey of reality and the tension between reality and expectation, that maybe we're on that road to Emmaus where, where we're just not quite sure what's happening here We had hoped that things would work out different. And as we'll see from Anna's story, it would be very similar. But what we sense is, I pray that we leave here with with, with this spirit, this expectation, and understanding the power of expectation. As we looked at Simeon's story last week, and the two are very connected because they happen very similarly at the same time. But regardless of your reality, let's let expectation grow in our hearts today. You see, we started looking, as I said, about Simeon last week. These two lesser-known characters, Simeon and Anna in Scripture, who we only have these two short stories of them, but they saw Jesus. They, they, they encountered the, Jesus as a baby, eight days old, in the temple, and they saw Almighty God incarnate in flesh. It's, it says that Anna came along while Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. I wonder if it's like sometimes what happens, you know, when somebody brings a new baby along to church, and everybody's like cooing around the pram. You know, they're cooing with Mary and Joseph, and Simeon's been holding them. He, he prophesies and talks about what's going to take place. But, but I wonder if they're all gathering around, and maybe, maybe they put a denarii in the pram, if that's what they do in those days. I don't know. Sometimes people do that these days. Not a denarii, of course. But, uh, but I wonder if that morning when she got up, like we looked at last week on that day, Simeon got up and was led by the Spirit to go there. But, but certainly she'd been waiting on this through years of faithfulness on living in the temple. But that day before her eyes, she saw expectation fulfilled. As she saw the Messiah, she saw the baby Jesus. Anna's story is similar to Simeon's in that she had similar expectations. She had longed to see the day when the Messiah would come. We don't know, like Simeon, he, he had been told by God that he was going to uh, see the Messiah and, with his own eyes. And we don't know if Anna had anything like that, of an experience like that. But certainly she'd expected something to happen. She'd expected the Messiah to come. But along the journey, what we see is that she experiences heartbreak. Things were maybe meant to have been different for her. That was her reality. We learn that she was a prophet and uh, she lived day and night in the temple. But what we also see from her example is that, that uh, when others could have become bitter at loss and the things that she experienced, she instead threw herself into the Lord. She, she lived day and night in the temple courts. It's significant, I believe, because she, even though faced the reality of disappointment, she still chose to live in expectation. And I love in how the narrative of these two stories, we see male and female. We see them both acting in the the prophetic. And we also uh, recognize that within this, in in this story, we see what what is being pointed at to us through the readings in Luke, that Jesus was to be a savior for all. Not just men, not just females, but together he was to be a savior for all people. It says that she talked to everyone who'd been waiting expectantly. So there were more than them at that time, but they were there that day and they saw the fulfillment of what they had expected come to pass. And like we did last week with Simeon, I want us to look at a few things today about what we can believe about expectation, what we can see when it comes to expectation. And the first thing I believe that we can see in in this passage as we look at Anna's story is this. Expectation fulfilled can be a corporate experience. You see, I love how when we read that, that verse, and it starts off, and it talks about that day, it says, Anna, it says, she was also there. 
She was also there. She was somebody who was there at that same time. There's something powerful about this scene because it wasn't just about Simeon seeing what had been prophesied coming to pass. This was about Anna too. There was something corporate about this fulfillment moment they were about to see that happened in the presence of those who were there. There's others who'd been waiting as well. Some were there. Some heard about it later on, but there was something of a corporate fulfillment of expectation that this was the dawn of a new day. This was something that they could join together and rejoice about. As a church, you know, I believe we're all looking forward and expecting, say, to the days when we get the keys to the new building. It's exciting. One of the great joys I had was showing many of you, and, and when we met that day up at the NAB, and you were able to take the plans around and start to begin to see where things were and what things would become up at the NAB in the, in, in the building. And, and you, you, there was some of you who were in tears. There was different things that was happening and, and, and excitement that started to grow. But one day we'll have fulfilled expectations, not just you know, for one or two, but it'll be for all of us. And for those who are yet to come, there's something of a fulfilled expectation that we can have a sense of excitement corporately and dream together because we're part of one family. And that's one of the great things about being part of the family of God. We can rejoice together. We can weep together. Romans 12 and verse, five, verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And that's the wonderful blessing of being part of a family of God. That's the, the blessing of these things that we've been reading this morning, is that when we're part of a family, we can rejoice with those who rejoice, and we can weep with those who weep. That's what we're told to do. And we know, and we've said before, that there's times when it's maybe easier sometimes to weep with those who weep than rejoice with those who rejoice. But that's, it. that's it. because sometimes we see other people rejoicing in things that we want ourselves, and that can be difficult. But actually, there's something corporately powerful when we get together to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep together over things that we need to see change coming. Even in, in heaven, we're told of celebrations that happen when somebody comes to know Jesus, and it talks about that, and there's, a, there's celebrations that take place over one sinner who returns, something of a corporate uh, sense of celebration. And Simeon and Anna, here they are, they've both been living in this sense of expectation of the Messiah to come, and both were there, and there is something powerful about sharing joy and sadness with the community. One of the, the, the I suppose, the, the great sad things that I found about COVID was the day that we were able to announce that we had the asset transfer, we're all popping party poppers at home in our houses on a screen. And that was nice, and it was a nice moment, but I would have loved to have been in the room. Just that sense of, of corporate expectation. But, uh, but hopefully, you know, in the not-too-distant future, we'll have a better day even than that. But I do believe that even as a church, we've got to get better at celebrating. Celebrating the small things that God does. Celebrating the praise reports. Don't be embarrassed to write down a praise report. We've got to celebrate the good things and thank God for what He does. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. But it's also why vision is important as well, because vision pr presents expectation that when some of these things get fulfilled, then we can join together and celebrate. There's something powerful about that. And we see in Anna's story that expectation fulfilled can be a corporate experience. The second thing I see in this story is that expectation is not age-dependent. Expectation is not age-dependent. You can live in expectation regardless of whether you are young or whether you're old. It says of uh, Anna, and it, literally the translation says these words, she was very old, right? I mean, but she was living in expectation, regardless of her age. It says that there she lived as a widow to the age of 84. If, if 84 and you're in this place today, then the Bible says that, not me, right? Um, but she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. And regardless of what age you are today, you can live any sense of expectation. Do you know that next week, Sarah turns 80? What a wonderful thing that she turns 80. And uh, do you know one thing I know of Andrew and Sarah? It was Andrew's birthday last week. You're 83 or 84? I forget. 83. 83. Okay. You're not quite very old. It says 84. Very old. So you're just, you're just relatively old. Um, but do you know one thing I, I honor about Andrew and Sarah is I know this. They both live in expectation. They both live in expectation. I can tell that because, it's, uh, because every Monday night when we meet for prayer, they walk up the stairs to the top floor of Ellsborough or take the lift, depending on how fit they're feeling that day. 
but they live in expectation. Expectation is not an age thing. You know, you might be young in this place today. Well, most of our young people are away out uh, just now. But, but when you're young, you have expectations of what the future will hold. Expectations of careers, relationships, of uh, family, different things like that. And different seasons of life bring different expectations. But let's not lose that sense of expectation the older we get. Let's live in expectation regardless of what age we are. I was reminded this week, I was reminded of, when I was younger, I used to love this Christian band called DC Talk, right? I don't know if any of you know those, that, that band. If you were a 90s kid or whatever, 80s kid growing up, then you probably, and if you were grown up in church, you would have known them. And me and my friend were big fans, and, and uh, I remember when they released a, a song and then an album called Jesus Freak, which I still hold as one of the greatest songs of all time. But uh, anyway... I remember when they were, when, when my, my friend and I, we met after school because they just released the, sig, the sig, single in Wesley Owen Bookshop in Falkirk. Wesley Owen doesn't even exist anymore. And we got together and we listened to this single. And I remember we were like in our teens, maybe even, yeah, it's probably mid-teens. And we're listening to this song. And I remember like wild expectations, silly stuff. I remember saying, wouldn't it be amazing, right? If DC Talk were to play the, what, at the time where Falkirk played was our local kind of football stadium. It was called Brockville. They, now it's in the Falkirk Stadium. But I, wouldn't, wouldn't it be amazing if DC Talk were to play Brockville? Oh, it'd be great. We'd get people from all over to come. And, and it, honestly, it was a wildly stupid thing to say, really, of expectation that could happen. DC Talk played one gig in the UK, and it was not in Falkirk. It was, uh, I think, at Manchester or somewhere like that. But, um, but you know what? Three, two, three years ago, I think it must have been three, the, one of the singers, DC Talk was made up of three singers. And one of the singers, however, played the Falkirk Stadium with the band that he now leads called Newsboys. And they played the song Jesus Freak at the Falkirk Stadium. Now, you can think, I'm not saying for one second that it was that wild expectation of a kid who was, you know, in his mid-teens who suddenly dreamed that that would happen. My dad sent me a video. He was involved in the running of the event. So the, one of the singers sent me a video asking me not to stop being a Jesus freak. So it was personalized. It was great. But I remember thinking just this week, reminded of that for some reason. And, and I thought, you know, I'm not saying that it was that expectation of us sitting in a bedroom listening to that song, that this would happen at the Falkirk Stadium. But what I am saying is this, don't dismiss your wild young expectations because you never know what God can do. You never know. The things that you dreamed as a, you know, that, that may have seem, seemed impossible, that, that who knows if it's just a little seed, a little seed that God's planted of faith within your heart to believe for the impossible. One thing I know is that I never want to lose that childlike expectation that God can do the impossible. And I pray that us here, regardless of what age we are, you know, that we would rather live and die in expectation and faith and hope than let expectation die. The Bible says that you can bear fruit in old age. In Caleb at 85, in Joshua 14, 12, he still had vision and says, Lord, give me this mountain. You can still live in expectation regardless of what age you are. You know, if you're younger in here, don't settle for what others expect of you, but have expectations of what God can do through you. If you're more of a senior saint in this place, don't let age diminish your dreams. Yeah, you might not have the energy that you used to, but you can still live in expectation for what God can do in your day and beyond. While you're alive, keep God-given expectation alive, because that's what we see in Anna. It says that she was old, but she still had a sense of expectation. And that day, in her 84th or 85th year, however you look at it, she saw her expectation come to pass. The third thing I see in this passage is this. Expectation can overcome disappointment. We know in these short verses, I love how the Bible explains and communicates quite a lot in a very short space of time. And uh, I love how it explains and it says, though, that her husband died when they'd be married only seven years. But we also find out from just the, the verse before, we know who she was, we know who her father was, we know the tribe that she was from, but we also see this really sad piece of information 
that Anna had, had a husband, she'd been married, and seven years after, I'm sure that, those, that, that when, you, when somebody gets married, they've got these expectations of what that will look like, the dreams of what that will look like in the future, but sadly, it was cut short. All we know is that her husband died. We don't know the circumstances around that, but, but what I know in that biblical times is that being a widow was a vulnerable position. There's no indication that it mentions here of her, uh, you know, the, the, the children or anything like that. But we know that she had, uh, we, we, well, we can know that like everyone who gets married, that there would have been expectation on her life at what the future would look like. And yet, sadly, she experiences this sorrow and disappointment. Yet something of that, even though she'd experienced that, it never, she never allowed that to kill her expectation that the Messiah was to come. She didn't allow sorrow and disappointment to, to rob her of expectation in her life. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes we can do that. Sometimes we can allow the things that we've experienced in the past experience to rob us from expecting what God can do in the future. Because we think, well, I've been there before. I, I don't want to trust again because I've seen trust damaged in some areas in the, of, our, of our lives. There's lots of stories where things happen. In Genesis 38, we read of of uh, Jacob, and he's on his way. And it says, As I was returning from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. So we've got this picture in the Old Testament of Jacob on a journey. And it says this, While he was still on the way, Rachel died to his sorrow. Rachel was his wife who he, he, he really loved. And, and he experiences that sadness while he's on this journey. And I think, you know, sometimes that can be a picture of our lives. That while we are journeying from reality to expectation, or we're, 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 we've not quite arrived at that place yet, we can experience sorrow along the way. To our sorrow, what happens may, may have died, or we experience a loss or something like that. You see, Jacob's family had previous in this. We read of Terah, who was Abraham's father, and he was journeying to Canaan, and well, he gets to, uh, well, you know, t t tells us in his story that his son Haran died. And uh, well, he's journeying there, it says that he stopped at Haran, and I mean, that's incredible loss. Let's not minimize what's taking place there. But it says that he, he stayed at Haran, he, he stayed at that place, which interestingly is named the same as what his son was, and he stays at that place of grief. But in Genesis 39, when we go back to the Jacob story, Genesis 39, verse 21 says this, Israel, or Jacob, it's the same person, moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. And you know, in our lives, we can all experience pain and loss, and we all will at some point, because that's life. But actually, the question I want to ask us is, are we going to park there? Are we going to let our expectation die because of disappointment? Are we going to stop along the journey because of what we've experienced? Or are we going to choose to live in expectation? You see, dis disappointment, I believe, can be one of expectation's biggest killers. Add to that his brother discouragement, which often can be another one of those that comes in the way. But it can take different forms. Sometimes we've been waiting too long. Sometimes that journey to expectation is far too long. And Proverbs 13, 12 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick. The longer we hope, the maybe that sense of further away it feels. Life doesn't turn out often how we expected it to. But what Anna does, and I think this is significant that all of us can learn from, is that Anna still chooses to live in expectation regardless of the disappointment that she faced. In fact, what she did is significant. She ran and, and lived in the house of God. How you deal with your disappointment matters. I wonder this morning if there's people in this room today who have experienced disappointment, how do you deal with it? What are you doing with it? Are you running away from it? Are you, are, are you choosing to stay and park at it? Or are you going to do what Anna does and run to the house of God. Or like Job, who, who when he experienced loss, he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or like David, who when he experienced loss, he got up and went to the temple and he worshipped. Or when Hezekiah received a letter from the, uh, the enemy, he took it and he spread it before the Lord in the temple. 
You see, what we see in Scripture is an example of how we ought to deal with disappointment. Rather than let it rob us of our expectation, we can take what our disappointment was and we can lay it to the, at the feet of Jesus. We can run to the place where we encounter the, the, the Lord and we can find that in that place we find, we find healing, we find restoration, and we can move on into a place of expectation again. These things can certainly be a challenge in our lives, and I'm not minimizing these things today. We're not immune to disappointment as Christians. But if you've come to, to Jesus thinking all your problems have been solved, then you know, you've been sold a lie because the reality is that, that we still face problems and difficulties in life. But what I do know is that the answer to those problems is found in Jesus, and we, we have a place where we can run to when disappointment comes. Don't let disappointment rob you of your expectation. The fourth thing I see in this is that expectation fulfilled comes from consistency. I think there's something powerful about just keeping on turning up. And I really do think that in my life, I've seen it, and I've seen it in other people's lives, the power of consistency. It says of Anna, it says that she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and praying. Listen, I cannot stress the importance of just keeping on turning up. They say that this, and you've probably heard this before, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. And I've heard that before, and maybe there's some points there's a truth to that, but actually I, there's something of, maybe if that's the definition of insanity, that we all need a little dose of insanity sometimes. Because at times I think we've got to keep turning up and turning up and expecting and living in expectancy, even though our reality doesn't match up what our expectancy is. So if that's what insanity is, maybe we just need a little bit more of that at times. Just keep turning up. Keep turning up and believing. Because do you know what I've found, and you read it in Scripture again, that every day, like what happened with Simeon last time where it says that day, every day has the potential to become a one day if you keep turning up. If you decide to stop turning up, then you miss out and maybe you become one who hears about it rather than ones who actually see it. Are you going to be a person today who keeps turning up? I think consistency is an undervalued quality at times, but I think it's certainly something that God values. And there's a pattern here of what Anna does, some things that ought to be consistent in the lives of the Christian. First of all, she lives in the house of the Lord. She gets to the house of God. That, let that be a pattern of consistency in your life. She worships day and night. It's develop a lifestyle of worship. Didn't worship, as I've said many times, and I'm sure you've heard in lots of different places, is not just what we do with a few songs at the beginning and end of a service. Worship is a lifestyle. It's how we ought to live our lives. It talks about she fasted. And, you know, even we just looked at that recently in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, when you fast, it's something that is important and should be consistent in our life because consistency led her that day to be in the right place at the right time. Are we going to be a consistent people? She saw the Messiah. And the fifth and final thing is this. Expectation fulfilled, I believe, needs to be shared. Anna says after that, she went and told people, she told all who had been waiting and hearing about what had happened, about who she'd seen. You know, each and every one of us who's a Christian in here, all of our Christian stories are that of expectation fulfilled. Because we too, like Anna, have seen the Messiah. We've had a revelation of who Jesus is, of how he saved us. And so our story is Anna's story. We have seen the Messiah. And, and what happened with Anna is the same that ought to happen with us. You see, Christianity has a confess with our mouths part. It's got a part where we have to tell of what God has done in our lives. It says that she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. And, you know, the, the people outside of, of here, outside of the, the church, outside of, of the kingdom of God, the people are waiting and expectantly. They're, they're waiting expectantly for the right message to come. People don't even know it. The Bible just, what I do know is what it says is that the, the people, they've got eternity in their heart. So there's something of them waiting on the right answer to come to them, but they just don't know it yet of what it is. You know, if we see Jesus, we need to tell people what's happened. People can't deny what you have gone through and what you've experienced. 
You know, we, we might in the future look at different things to do with reasons for our faith, and there's things that we can, that, that can be tooled up so we can give a reason why, uh, you know, it's a, a, a proper response called apologetics as to why we believe that God exists, and that's a, that, that, knowing that stuff's important. I, I'm not taking away from that today. But listen, your testimony and what God has done in your life is personal to you and is a story that needs to be shared. You once were blind, but now you see. You once never knew the Messiah, but now like Anna and Simeon did too, we see the Messiah. We're going to bring this to a close. Band are going to come. And, and I want us to think on this morning that tension of expectation and reality. I want you to think today about the things that's, that's in your life, the reality of what you're experiencing right now. And let's not lose that sense of expectation regardless of what our reality might be. Let's remember today from Anna's story that expectation fulfilled is a corporate experience. And I pray that we will have joint expectations as a church and as people who who are looking and believing so that when, when people come to know Jesus, that's one of our expectations. We long to see people come to know Jesus, but we can celebrate together. I want to remind you today like with Anna, the expectation is not age dependent, that you too can dream again this morning. Do you know, if something has robbed your expectation, if age has robbed it, then let something of that faith begin to rise again. Dream again. Believe for the impossible to happen. I want you to remember today that expectation can overcome disappointment and discouragement. I wonder what tragedy or or pain, or hardship you've experienced, which causes you to maybe just think, hey, I'm done with believing for that now. I believed there, but I've been hurt in that area before. Or maybe that challenge of consistency in our lives, because expectation, I believe, fulfilled comes from consistency. Or maybe there's this challenge in our lives today just to share what we've seen. Because our hearts one day we saw our expectation that was deep-rooted, that, that longing of our soul when we come to know Jesus. I pray today that we will see those expectations that the Lord has placed in our heart come to pass. I want us to bow our head a minute and then pray.
the bound will go free the weak will be strong the broken redeem the sick will be well the hungry will feast the morning will dance the blinded will see the church will There's nothing to fear Revival is now The kingdom is here Let the church say amen Let the church say amen Death is defeated Jesus is risen This is our faith The good news of Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We hope that this service was an encouragement to you today. We'd love to see you in person at Sandvi next Sunday at 11 a.m. You can sign up at our Church Suite app or by contacting us at admin at newlifeshetland.com. If we can be of any help, then contact us at that email. But we will see you same time, same place next week. God bless you.